and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 141, Stalin's Mistake. Putting the cart before the horse, August 7th found Hitler with von Rundstedt, commander of Armor Group South, talking to Romania's head civil servant, General Antonescu, in Berdichev, a Ukrainian city, and also Rundstedt's headquarters. The Romanian was being given the Knight's Cross by Hitler himself for helping clear out all Soviet forces west of the Dnieper River. This was one of the key prerequisites before Moscow and Leningrad could be moved against. The three men then went their separate ways. But now that the medals had been passed out, it was time to make real what had been announced as achieved. So, five days later, as it was clear that there were still Soviet troops on their side of the Dnieper, the OKH ordered Army Group South to kill or capture all enemy forces between Zempora, some 250 miles or 402 kilometers northeast of Odessa, and the mouth of the Dnieper, just to the east of Odessa, to trap the men of the Soviet 9th, 18th, and coastal armies along the Black Sea. This would allow the advance to continue south of Kiev, once that city had fallen, of course. The capture of the city was to be carried out by Reichenau's 6th Army, but to the northwest of Kiev, just sitting there, was Potapov's 5th Army. If the German 6th moved on to Kiev, the Soviet 5th might come south and hit their flank, or rear, or the Soviet force might move north and threaten Army Group Center's right flank. In chess, a piece that can threaten several sectors at one time is truly well placed. Still, Kiev was the next item on the list, whose fall would open up a general offensive towards Leningrad, Moscow, and the agricultural riches to the south. So, on August 6th, Reichenau's leading units moved forward and reached the edge of western Kiev. But they were immediately halted by Vlazov's 37th Army, and the Russians had laid into the Germans with such ferocity that the invaders went on the defensive, which only encouraged the Soviets more, certainly with Stalin's prodding on August 12th. The defensive line in front of the city was straightened out, something important in military matters. But what's more, on that same day, Hitler, in reacting to the slapping down of Reichenau's men, ordered Rundstedt to halt the attack on Kiev. He had devised a better, less costly, as in his men, way to take the city. The Luftwaffe supporting Army Group South would be resupplied. Kiev would be destroyed from the air, its defenses wrecked. While this resupplying was going on, Reichenau was to turn his 6th Army against Potapov's 5th. As Napoleon said, it's the army in the field that matters, not the city that can't hold a sword. But events outside of Army Group South were about to affect this theater and the others. As wave after wave of Soviet counterattacks came on, trying to save Smolensk, or Leningrad, by attacking below Lake Ilmen, Hitler reacted to these by having Army Group Center stop its march on Moscow. Then, the 29th Motorized Corps of Army Group Center was ordered to go and help with the attack against Leningrad on August 15th. But capturing the prize that was Moscow was Army Chief of Staff Colonel General Franz Halder's pet project. So, he finagled men and material and came up with a new plan for Army Group Center to continue on to Moscow. But not only did Hitler turn this down, but then told the OKH to draw up a directive that would be taken to Army Group Center's command Bach personally, which would order him to take another section of his armor and send it south. The directive would make it clear to all that the priorities for the foreseeable future, and probably the rest of the year, were the Donitz Basin, just north of the Sea of Azov, which held much Russian industry and coal, the Crimea, and as much of Leningrad as possible. Not on the list was Moscow. 
When the directive was written up, Hitler had Halder personally take it to Bach's headquarters. Bach was unhappy, but Guderian lost it. Together, both men flew back to Berlin to talk to Hitler, which changed nothing. So on August 24th, Guderian had numerous units of the 2nd Panzer Group make their way south. Yet because Stalin still believed Hitler's main focus was on Moscow, he had those units near, above, and below Kiev stand firm. They were to protect the city and hold the crossings over the Dnieper at all costs. His guess was that Moscow would not be moved against until Kiev fell. With the word given, the Stavka began to manifest Stalin's will. On August 19th, Lieutenant General Kurpanos was told to pull back Major General Poptava's 5th Army back across the Dnieper, who would then begin to construct defensive works. Meanwhile, Vlazov's 37th Army was to create and hold a small bridgehead near Kiev on the western side of the river, in case the Russians wanted to exploit something further west. So far, so good. These were sound tactical dispositions. But then Stalin the neophyte went too far. Creating the 40th Army under Major General Podlas, it was given the task of holding the line near Novgorod, some 200 miles northeast of Kiev, along the Desna River, due east of the Dnieper. There, it would be in between the 21st and 13th Army, which sounds impressive. But these two rifle divisions and an airborne corps were to, somehow, hold out against two panzer divisions with two motorized and one cavalry division that was coming their way. Still, orders were orders, and the faster these respective units could get to the eastern side of the waterway and begin their defensive works, the safer they would be. Yet, it didn't turn out that way. Someone forgot to ask the Germans to stand still. Poptapov's 5th Army started moving back on August 21st, and the idea was simple enough. With the Germans so close, this part of the line would fall back as a whole in stages, and it would be across the river by August 25th. Yet the Germans did stay close, smelling out weak points, and they found one on Poptapov's left flank. The 37th Army's 27th Rifle Corps allowed the German 51st Army Corps to get in close and then push them aside, long enough to cross the Dnieper themselves and establish a small bridgehead just above Kiev. So the second Poptapov's left flank was across the river. Its security was compromised. Poptapov, to his credit, figured this out pretty quickly and so moved back again, this time making sure the Germans stayed back as he and his crossed the Desna River to the immediate east of the Dnieper, above the city, and re-established their defensive line. It wasn't where the Stavka wanted it, but it was secure. Yet, as this second redeployment was underway, Guderian's panzers were already in the relative area, having come down from Armour Group Center, and now threatened to place themselves where the still-forming 40th Army of Podlas was supposed to be. When the 21st and 13th Armies of the Bryansk Front looked at each other through their field glasses, instead of seeing the 40th, they saw the leading panzers. The situation was equally bad south of Kiev. Tuliniev's forces, readying to cross the Dnieper, were almost stranded as their own engineers blew up the dam there too soon which flooded the river at their selected crossing. The waterway quickly swelled to a kilometer and a half. The men of the Soviet 9th and 18th Armies struggled, but crossed the widening river on August 22nd. As August came to an end, the defensive situation improved for the Russians south of Kiev. Along the Dnieper, which wound its way far to the southeast before coming back west as it got closer to the coast, Soviet Rifle Corps, or armies, were stationed along the way. Meanwhile, Odessa, which had been pretty much bypassed by Army Group South as they rushed to the Dnieper, far to its east, was being protected by Lieutenant General Savronov's 
coastal army. Above Kiev, Kirpanov's southwest front, along with Potaba's 5th Army, held the line. Yet that line, as we have seen, had already been penetrated along the Dnieper. This left the defense of the city to Vlazov's 37th Army, with the 26th and 38th Armies protecting against any German advance just south of the city, as they were lined up next to other Soviet armies holding the line all the way down to the coast. Yet the Russians weren't alone along the Dnieper. Reichenau's 6th Army was stationed to the north and south of Kiev. Stupanego's 17th Army faced the Soviets south of the city, from Cherkasy, 100 miles or 160 kilometers below Kiev, for a distance of 75 miles or 120 kilometers, until Kremenjug, and below them, dealing with the long bend of the Dnieper, was Kleist's 1st Panzer Group. Further south were the Romanian 3rd and German 11th armies that sat poised along the river all the way to the coast. Of note, to the south of Kiev, Rundstedt's forces outnumbered the defenders 2 to 1 in aircraft and 4 to 1 in armor. This had taken quite a bit of moving of the chess pieces, but now Kiev, especially to its south, was truly facing overwhelming odds. However, for all of this, the real threat for right now was above Kiev. By the end of August, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group, which had left Army Group Center on Hitler's orders, was now near the Desna River, close to Novgorod. By September 3rd, the Panzers had established several bridgeheads across it and were threatening Kirpano's rear area. Stalin had ordered Lt. Gen. Ermenko, before August ran out, to destroy the German armor. But that was easier said than done. The Russians charged at the Panzer's flanks, but Guderian, expecting this, acted accordingly, pushed through, and continued south, getting in behind the major city. By September 7th, his tanks were at Konotop, about a hundred miles east-northeast of Kiev. And just like that, all of those Soviet rifle divisions along the Dnieper to the south and north were meaningless. Kiev would be attacked from behind, and then the German armor could push on south, now on the eastern side of the river, and roll up the Soviet defenders, who were all facing west. Yet Stalin still wanted and believed that Kiev could be defended. On that same day, September 7th, the Chief of General Staff, Marshal Shaposhnikov, and General Staff Officer Vasilevsky again tried to talk Stalin into abandoning the city and pull back the Soviet forces located north of the city. Yes, territory would be lost, but Russian soldiers would be saved. As it was, if the leader gave the go-ahead, even now, it would still be a dicey thing to move those forces back with the Germans right there and now behind them. Yet Stalin's reaction was a compromise, not usually a good thing in making military decisions. The 5th Army could pull back. The 37th Army could set itself up in a better defensive position, i.e. closer to Kiev. But the dictator started screaming when the discussion turned to abandoning the city. Stalin yelled that the men weren't trying hard enough, that they didn't understand how that jeopardized the entire theater. But it was Stalin who did not understand. His compromise had the Soviet line bending back above Kiev, and it was already bent back to the south due to the flow of the Dnieper. This left Kiev the furthest point west, and the Germans were closing in. Yet, not everything went Rundstedt's way. To the north of Kiev, a combination of rough terrain, the toughness showed by Potapov's 5th Army, and finally, intermittent German logistics, slowed down the advance of the German 6th and 2nd Armies. However, Rundstedt foresaw this, in terms of he expected nothing but victory, but feared that if his men took too long, the Soviets might be able to flee again. So, days before, in late August, the commander of Army Group South 
ordered Kleist's first panzer group, which had already traveled south and helped destroy the Soviet 6th and 12th armies, make their way due east and cross the Dnieper, just south of Kremenchuk, about 120 miles or 193 kilometers southeast of Kiev. The orders were to not worry about their flanks, just barrel across and be ready to turn north to make sure those Soviet forces in front of and just behind Kiev did not escape. This action was carried out. The German 17th Army's 52nd Army Group wrestled a bridge from the Russians on the last day of August in the south. Within 10 days, the majority of it and the 50th Army Corps were across the Dnieper. Marshal Budeni, commander of the Southwest Front, took an unrealistic page from Stalin's book and ordered the 38th Army to destroy all those German forces now across the river to the south. This was wishful thinking. Not only was the 38th too small, it also lacked enough firepower of the right kind. And even then, by September 4th, Kleist's panzer group units already across, were ordered to expand their holdings on the eastern side. By September 12th, enough panzer forces were across to begin their attack. Moving northwesterly, the tanks moved out. First, Colonel Chubashev's 297th Rifle Division was smashed about 20 kilometers to the north. Meanwhile, the next day, September 13th, Hoob's 16th Panzer Division, on a more northerly heading, attacked and took control of Lubna, some 18 miles or 30 kilometers. The rail line that ran through it was cut. But then, a thrown-together force of anti-aircraft artillerymen and a local defense force stopped the Panzers. It wasn't the bravery of the men that did it. It was their artillery. But the tanks of Hoob would not be stymied for long. Coming up behind them were the panzers of the 9th Division. What's more, Hoob's left flank was being protected by the 14th Panzer Division. In this section, behind the Dnieper, southeast of Kiev, chaos reigned for the defenders. As bad as this was, and it had the makings of more numerous armies being trapped, Kurpanos to the north of Kiev was faring worse but not because of a lack of weapons or men, but because of an overabundance of short-sightedness and fear of Stalin. On September 10th, as the panzers of Kleist were raging to the southeast of Kiev, Lieutenant General Kupanos reported to the Stavka that enemy armor had made its way to Romney, about 125 miles or 201 kilometers east-northeast of Kiev that the 21st and 40th armies ordered to destroy these forces were less than successful. And, as the situation stood, it only made sense to Kurpanos that other forces be used to block any further southern progress of those panzers. So, not to put too fine a point on it, a corridor still existed for all those forces of the Kiev-fortified region to be able to flee when the time came. In fact, his report went on, as the Germans were clearly not going to attack the city directly from the west, given our forces there close to the city, but mostly due to the fact that they already had panzers behind the defensive line and the city. It only made sense to use some of those idle forces within the city to help manifest their own escape. This message was sent to Shaposhnikov the chief of the general staff, who responded, not wanting to end up shot himself, that all Soviet forces were to stay in place and fight the enemy wherever they found them. That was bravado. Now it was time for the lie. Calling the 3rd and 4th Panzer Division's current operations behind Kiev nothing more than a German sortie, Shaposhnikov declared that the forces in place but probably with the help of those along the Dnieper, could handle the situation. This was getting the Russians nowhere. German panzers were coming up behind Kiev from the south and the north. Within days, all those Soviet forces in and around the city, and we are talking three-fourths of a million men, would be trapped. So, on September the 11th, 
Budeni sent a message to Stalin, pulling no punches. Quote, the withdrawal of the southwestern front is completely imminent. Any delay would only bring the loss of forces and a huge quantity of logistical units. Such things may sound cruel, but have to be taken into consideration during war. Stalin replied simply, Do not abandon Kiev and do not blow up the bridges without Stavka permission. His order, of course, was obeyed. The situation of those defending Kiev and the surrounding area grew worse. Two days later, General Mogul's 3rd Panzer Division from Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group closed in on Lovitsa, about 100 miles or 160 kilometers east of Kiev, from the north. As things stood now, there was only a 24-mile or 40-kilometer gap in between the 3rd Panzer and the 16th Panzer as they approached Lubna from the south. Kirpana's whole front, made up of the 5th, 37th, 26th, and 38th armies were about to be trapped in a rough circle 200 kilometers or 120 miles deep, and its anchor, Kiev, was still not allowed to be abandoned. Yet there was still time and space to escape, but it was closing fast. Stalin hung on to the idea that it was the commanders in the field, lack of backbone, that was the problem. So, on September 13th, he replaced Budeni with Timoshenko as the commander of the Southwestern High Command. Timoshenko patriotically responded by declaring that his men would hold the line. But on that same day, Kleist's and Guderian's panzers were only some 24 miles or 40 kilometers apart. Timoshenko might have been nothing more than a mouthpiece, echoing Stalin's order but his chief of staff, Major General Topipkov, put his life over his pride. Writing to Shepovshnikov, Tupikov said, The catastrophe that is clear to you will occur in a matter of several days. But then Stalin got wind of this and spoke into Shepovshnikov's other ear, and his tune had not changed. The men were to stay where they were, and destroy the Germans as they made contact. No one was to retreat. Kiev would be held, and no bridges were to be blown. But even this determined defiance did not matter, as three days later, the gap was closed. On September 16th, Guderian's and Kleist's panzers met up near Lakvitsa. Now elements of the 2nd and 1st panzer groups were in between those Russian soldiers around Kiev, and relative freedom to the east. This new reality caused even the sycophantic Timoshenko and his commissar, Khrushchev, to send word to Kapanas that he and his were now free to retreat some 250 kilometers, or 402 miles, to the east, to the Pasel River. Yet Timoshenko was no fool. The orders were given by word of mouth. There would be nothing for Stalin to hold, as he ordered Timoshenko's death. Yet Kirpanos wasn't a fool either. He would not be given the order to retreat without something in writing. Such was their fear of Stalin. Yet communications in the area, by this time, were far from perfect. So the order to retreat wasn't received until the night of September 17th. And then it came from Shaposhnikov, not Timoshenko. But the order's had been changed by then. Kiev was to be abandoned, but all other forces were to remain in place. They were certainly not to retreat to the Pasel River. And though I don't know which Russian for, to hell with this, Kirpanos must have muttered it to himself, as he, on his own authority, ordered the 5th, 21st, 26th, and 37th armies to attack eastward through the rows of German armor. The Soviet 38th and 40th armies had the unenviable task of protecting the retreating forces' flanks. Yet these orders and movements were on paper only. The soldiers of each army, except those within Kiev, were now under constant attack from various sides. Still, it was their only chance for survival. So the men moved out 
But lacking supplies and organization, the various Soviet units were carved up, broken down into smaller formations, and destroyed or captured. Those that survived from day to day, or rather hour to hour, moved east. During that third week of September, the Russians lost thousands of men. Commands were destroyed, men were obliterated, supplies ran out, and equipment was torn to pieces by German shells. Also during this time, the Stavka sent message after message to anyone who would answer and tell them what the hell was going on. On September 21st, Shapanishkov tried to cover his backside by telegraphing the following questions over and over. Has Kiev been abandoned? Have the bridges been blown? Who can vouch that they have indeed been destroyed? This from the higher-ups that demanded that no major action be taken without their permission. But the reply was silence. Communications were down, shattered more like, and besides, everyone was running or riding with whomever at this point was next to them, fighting to keep the Germans back as they made their way east. In this confusion, General Sotensky, the 5th Army's artillery commander, was captured. The others with him were either killed or driven into some nearby woods. Kirpanos and Tupikov were killed. Poptavov and the officers with him were captured. Just like Bielistok and near Minsk, this newly formed German encirclement was hardly complete. Some managed to escape, but only by breaking down into smaller groups and traveling at night. This way, Budeni, Timoshenko, and Khrushchev managed to make it to the east. This was Minsk all over again, but on a much larger scale. On the 1st of September, the Southwest Front had some 755,000 men, even more if one counts their reserves. Almost 4,000 guns, 114 tanks, and 167 aircraft. But as September neared its end, the Germans had surrounded some 452,000 men, just over 2,500 guns, and 64 tanks. Within two more weeks, only some 15,000 men of the 850,000, the real total number, would escape. Gone were the 5th, 37th, 26th, and 21st armies, some 43 divisions. The Southwest Front would have to be rebuilt from the ground up. But for now, the way behind Kiev and to its south was open for many kilometers. Further south, but still above Odessa, a slightly higher percentage of soldiers managed to escape, though they took very little with them. At Odessa, the Soviets had been holding off the Romanian 4th Army for more than a month. Around the port city was a Soviet rifle division, two naval infantry brigades, sailor detachments, and six destroyer detachments. During that time, three defensive rings had been laid around the city, and this was actually pushed out a bit in late August, as the Stavka ordered a limited offensive for that very purpose. And protecting all this were Soviet gunships. But by late September, the German 11th Army had left the Odessa area and was well on its way to the Crimea. Odessa's defense was suddenly pointless. So the Stavka ordered the Odessa garrison to evacuate and make for Sevastopol on the Crimea. This was somehow successfully carried out between October 2nd and the 16th. Yet once the forces were there, they would find themselves surrounded again. But this time, their fate was far less rosy. By October, the South, at least as far as the Dnieper, belonged to the Germans, which would allow them to start operations even further east, towards Kharkov and towards the Crimea. But even more, the right flank of any army approaching Moscow would be relatively safe. Hitler and his Nazi party had gotten German forces further into and closer to Moscow in a few months than Kaiser Wilhelm had in years. Barbarossa had been messier thus far than planned, but it was coming together, 
Leningrad would fall, the Crimea would be taken, and Moscow would be invested. Truly, the high water mark of the Third Reich was approaching fast. Okay, everyone, so now we're ready for the uh, Harry's Winston set uh, giveaway for all the members. So for all you members, this is just my way of saying thank you for supporting the show over the years or, or however long you've been a member. And for those of you who recently joined up, thank you as well. Hope you enjoy the 60-something episodes that are out there. So what I'm going to do is have my three lovely assistants each pick two names. Then uh, we'll pair it down, get it down to three, and then we'll have our final winner. Then I'll email the winner. So, um, who would like to draw a name first? Sophie? Mm-mm. No, of course not. Because the, that would make too much sense. Kiki, would you like to draw a name? You could draw a name. Reach in there, move it around. There you go. You don't have to get the very bottom one, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. All right, so the first one is... Daryl Ray. So, Daryl Ray, you're one of the first of the finalists. Okay. Um, Heather, would you like to pick one? Yes, I would. <laughs> you can't tell her which one to pick, Kiki. Tree monkey. <coughs> Tree monkey. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Chris Sullivan. Okay, the next next person. Okay, Sophie, would you please draw a name? All right. Okay, just, just don't, you don't have to rearrange it. Just draw it. All right, thank you. Let's see here. Quentin Weber. Okay, so we each, I need each of you to uh, each draw one more. Go ahead, Sophie. Just pick a name. All right. No. Nope. Okay. Just pick a name. Just pick a name. Pick a piece of paper. There we go. That was painful. Um, Don Gardner. Garnier. Uh, we're about to find out anyway, so thank you. So, Don, you're in. Who's one more? Okay, Kiki, your turn. Okay, step back, Sophie. Your work here is done. Okay, all right. Stefan Sakita. Sakita. So, all right, so I need one more. Thank you, honey. Jeremy Palmer. Okay, so we've got our six finalists. Yay! So let's get rid of all that. I'm not cleaning that up. Okay, so let's get it down to three names. Okay, no looking in the bowl this time. So each of you pick one name and... Yeah. I don't want to go first. Oh, God. Let me go first. All right. Oh, she handed me four of them. Okay. Okay, so Daryl Ray is one of the three finalists. Kiki? Okay, now give it to me. Don't smell it. There we go. Just let go. <laughs> Jeremy Palmer. Okay, the second of three finalists. Sophie. Okay, yeah, just there we go. Thank you. Hey, and Quentin Weber. Okay, so we have our three finalists for the Harry's Winston set shaving kit. So we got three more. Okay, who's gonna? Oh, I didn't think this through. Who's gonna draw the winner? Maybe I should draw the winner because because you two will fight over it. Okay, no, so I'm not, I'm way far as far as I can be from the bowl, so I'm stirring it up, and I'm moving my hand around just to make it as fair as I possibly can, and the winner for the Harry's Winston, no, you can't do that, is Jeremy Palmer, so Jeremy, I will be uh, emailing you to let you know you won, congratulations, and again, thank you to everybody, uh, all you members who support the show, I'll try to do more stuff like this. But again, I just want to say thank you. Um, Yay! Yay. Yeah! Yay. So. Yay. All right. I'll see you soon.